I would also like to welcome you to the first session of the Post-Industrial City. My name is Maisoon Rizk, and I'm your moderator for the morning. So um, I'm very excited to be here and to look forward to the speakers that we're going to have today. But I'm going to go ahead and begin with an introduction to Robin Boyle, who is Professor of Urban Planning and Chair of the Urban Studies and Planning Department here at Wayne State University in Detroit. He is currently co-directing Wayne's Detroit Revitalization Fellows Program, a critical component of a region-wide talent attraction and retention strategy with a focus on capacity building in Detroit. His research interests have focused on large cities and their economic condition. He has attracted external funding for research into the impact of an aging society and how to adapt the built environment to assist, quote, aging in place, end quote. This morning, he will be presenting with graduate student Matthew or Matt Lewis on the topic of making music again, an assessment of Detroit's contemporary neighborhood music industry. Please help me. Out. Good morning. Thank you very much for these opening remarks. I've actually just come from Gr Grand Rapids, so I'm still actually driving. I can, I can feel my, uh, my, my body shake. Um, well, first off, I'd like to reintroduce Matt Lewis, um, uh, who's an MUP candidate, Master of Urban Planning candidate, um, in our Department of Urban Studies and Planning, and he's uh, a graduate assistant working on the Detroit Revitalization Fellows Program, which I hope we can maybe talk more about uh, later on Day. And we've decided to actually split our, our presentation. Um, I'm not going to actually present that he is, because he has done a number of the, of the most recent field work, and, and I think this is a great opportunity to learn from graduate students, you know, rather than somebody with a with grey beard um, for a change. But to do this work through Matt, I'd like to in, indulge your um, indulge you for, for a few minutes by setting the context for this topic, but also for the broader theme of the post-industrial city um, today. I'm not going to do it from the perspective of, of an economic um, analysis, which would be better done by my good colleague George Galster, who's in the audience, or, or even from a, a broader-based um, empirical assessment of how our cities have changed. I want to actually bring it through the lens of, of, of a policy Analysis, And I hope you'll bear with me as I take you through a little bit of history that I think is important to understand where we are, where we are in the city of Detroit today. To set this work into context, I'd like to, in a sense, review a critical theme that I think is important in urban policy here in, in the United States. One that I actually started working on several years ago, many years ago in fact, with colleagues from the University of Delaware, who I am indebted to for actually physically being here. If it wasn't for these folks, I would be three and a half thousand miles on the other side of the pond. Um, the title of my remarks actually is The U.S. City Policy Intervention and the Evolution of Privatism. And my case is going to be that our pursuit of an economic rationale has resulted in the place that we have and the condition that we have in cities like Detroit. Private institutions have long played a dominant role in American cities. To paraphrase President Calvin Coolidge, the business of America is... Business. Thank you. Accordingly, accordingly, the American city was and still is perceived by and large as an economic entity. For those in the audience who are avid watchers of HBO, Boardwalk Empire might be a very good example. Now, obviously, I exaggerate to make my point, because we're not killing everybody and scalping people, but the economic pursuit of that city, I think, uh, says a lot about what I'm trying to say. Bloomfield, an historian, writes that, quote, essentially, American cities developed as money mining camps with the mentality and characteristics of such camps, a sense of impermanence and the indifference to despoiling the environment. So, uh, I better stop this. So, perhaps Deadwood is a better analogy for e others who are equally into HBO, but I enough of that. Let me get a little bit more serious. As the historian Sam Bass Warner wrote, privatism is the quality which above all else characterizes our urban landscape. Let me define the term, privatism. 
Privatism is more than simply the activity of the private sector or of business. In the 20th century, privatism in the US came to encompass a distinctive set of expectations about the functions and activities of private firms, public bureaucracies, private markets, and public policy. In essence, this is the intertwining of the private sector and the public domain, something which is, in my opinion, almost distinctively American. And this interconnection is supported by an assumption that the private sector is inherently dynamic, productive, and dependable. A belief that private institutions are intrinsically superior to often flawed public institutions for the delivery of goods and services, and that market efficiency is the appropriate criterion of social performance in almost all spheres of community activity. And if you want to listen to, for example, Governor Snyder's justification for emergency managers being brought into cities that are failing, then I think you'll get my drift. The tradition of privatism has meant that community performance is judged primarily by a standard of economic performance and productivity. Uh, another historian, Daniel Borstein, cogently argued, Americans perceived of cities as places without history, um, emerging in the then 19th century, free of vested interests, private interests, uh, uh, free of vested interests, guilds, skills, no trespassing signs. This was tabla rasa. This was a place in which the market too could expand. So instead, mar municipal mercantilism, private infrastructure, and urban rivalry shaped the cities. So private bridge building, including one to the uh, a foreign country is not uncommon. This, I, this idea that our cities could be constructed around a business model is something which is deeply embedded uh, in, in our urban culture. One can attest, for example, that through the first decades of the 20th century, even including the progressive era, growing government policy and state intervention, which did grow, I have to admit, provided stability, order, and predictability in a turbulent economic environment so that the private sector could continue to function effectively and try and reduce risk. And furthermore, it can be argued that the municipal reform movement was an attempt to adjust the range and functions of public in institutions to the enlarged domain and emerging needs of new industrial enterprises. In a sense, what they were doing was lubricating the growth machine. And we've had that now for the best part of 100 years. It says here, if time permits, elaborate about the introduction of land use zoning. But I won't, because I think it'll take up too much time. But I would come back, if anyone in the audience is interested, in an argument that um, although land use zoning is much de decried by the Mackinac Center or others um, from uh, the right, in actual fact, zoning was there to support what was uh, emerging in this, in this place. I would argue that it's unsurprising that therefore in the post-World War II era, urban policy and programs, national and local, were, were most often guided by an expectation that the solutions to emerging urban problems, public problems, lay in mobilizing the power, wealth, <coughs> managerial skills and expertise of American corporations. What's good for business would, Senatus Paribus, all things being equal, be good for the community. Hence. While government was the first responder to widespread urban disorder in the 1960s, when the troops were out there on 14th Street, it was the private sector that was charged with providing lasting solutions. Here in Detroit, for those who maybe are not familiar with this, this region or its history, private corporations were challenged to step up after what um, Dean Thomas said was occurred in 67. Detroit Edison, our power company, for example, created um, a vision for the region. GM and Ford were asked to, build, to step up and build a new downtown, the Renaissance Center. New Detroit would address racial division and the business community as a whole through Detroit Renaissance would reposition the city for the 21st century. I'm not sure we've done a particularly good job. Now, this is when it gets complicated. Where the private sector could not or would not take responsibility, then the federal government would and did intervene. Now, obviously, there was a political rationale for that as well. The vote was here, and therefore the politicians at the national level did, did develop some form of a, of a spatial policy, urban policy. But I would argue that this federal interest in cities from the 1940s through to the late 1970s 
was in reality short-lived. I mean, that's just for 30 years or so. And urban policy over this period was indeed somewhat weak, but was connected to continuing this model of privatism. In almost every dimension of urban policy as it, as it evolved between the late 40s and the late 70s, the private sector was to be the deliverer of public change, supported by federal dollars. I listed four or five bullet points. Suburban housing development, FHA and tax policy. Slum housing clearance and urban renewal that would be delivered by private developers like Lafayette Park. Successfully, I have to add. Interstate travel was funded by the private, uh, by the public uh, dollar to actually create interstate commerce. Business development in cities would be supported by the Economic Development Administration, not to support small firms, but actually to support um, existing corporations. Affordable housing and HUD, and last but by no means least, central city redevelopment was supported by HUD's many layers of grants and loan guarantees. And nowhere was this more obvious than in the whole question of civic redevelopment in the 60s and 70s, with, the many, fam with many famous uh, being in the, in the industrial centres, beginning to show in the 1960s the first cracks in their industrial might. The cities such as Pittsburgh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, St. Louis, and Detroit, and many, many more. Now that list sounds eerily familiar with the list of post-industrial cities. There is not the space to examine all these initiatives in detail, but I'd like to pull out three points, if I could. My first point is that civic redevelopment agencies of the time, and many are still in place, shifted the direction and scope of civic public activity to overwhelmingly support private projects, often at the cost of other agendas. Here in Detroit, for example, Coleman Young's Economic Growth Corporation is a model example of this trend. And if you don't buy that one, open up the free press and look at the activities of an organization called the Wayne County Business Development Corporation, which is widely reported as to an organization that is using foundation money to support um, several activities that would normally be considered um, in the public realm. And yet, this body is unelected and effectively unaccountable. So my second point, is that these agencies were, un were, were undertaking what were termed public projects, many uh, with civil, civic development agencies that were um, unelected and unaccountable. <coughs> and thirdly, as these agencies and their projects evolved, they sought to gather first public funds, then private funds, federal dollars, and then finally foundation support. They did this in order to keep the engine running as best they could. Where could we think of a similar project that has gone from public to private to foundation support? Look out on M1, uh, look out on Woodward, where they're planning on building a light rail system up the centre of, of Woodward. A little bit of history and now I'll, I will speed up. It was in the 1970s and most aggressively in the 80s under both Carter and Reagan that privatism took hold in the cities. What was good for business was clearly good for cities. You see? President Coolidge was right after all. <laughs> Municipal marketing and civic entrepreneurship became the core activities of government. Cities that succeeded in economic development would create a favorable climate for private investment. And this, in turn, would place these communities, communities like such as Youngstown, Flint, Akron, Milwaukee, Fort Wayne, in a preferred position to win the urban economic sweepstakes. Not sure they won. This was not a preferred policy agenda or a preferred policy approach. This was the essential policy approach for urban survival of the 1980s and 1990s. But that civic survival was to be te tested, if not indeed broken, by the transformation of the US economy that began in the aftermath of the global oil crises of the mid-1970s and has continued to impact communities across the nation ever since. But what has happened to the industrial US and its cities is not simply the outcome of free market forces or globalization or trade policy, but is also, my argument, the product of this evolution of privatism and its impact in place. 
President Carter had a commission, the Commission on the National Agenda for the 1980s. Most of you in the room will not remember this so-called commission. You weren't even born. But it is important, I would suggest. Because this commission and what it said to Carter and to Reagan would have a devastating impact on many communities, resulting indeed in the moniker of today's symposium, the post-industrial post city. The most publicized or, inf or infamous aspect of this report from the, from the Carter Commission was its call for public acceptance and encouragement of the transition of population, jobs and industry from cities in the north, east and the midwest to the Sun Belt. The Commission pointed out that the industrially based urban centres were being unravelled and that the advantages of agglomeration and central location were being eroded by, quote, technological innovation and new production technologies that have given, and I quote again, locational freedom to an ever wider range of industries. That's 30 years ago that this report was written. And I'm going to quote again. The government should aim, this is from the Carter Commission, the, the, the Carter Report. The government should aim pr principally to remove barriers between people and economic opportunity. We believe that a people to job strategy, repeat, people to job strategy, based on vigorous programs of assisted migration, skill acquisition, should receive, this, the, the, should receive the emphasis that has been reserved in recent years for a jobs to people strategy based upon local economic development. In essence, what this was doing was laying the ground rules for, for a policy that said it is not the city that matters per se, it is the individuals in the city. And if their best chances lay in, in Spring Hill, Tennessee, then it is to Spring Hill, Tennessee, which is, where, by the way, where Saturn was built for, the, for General Motors, then that is where people should go, and they should be encouraged to go there accordingly. Unfortunately, they did, they did not then turn the page and say, we will also have a set of policies that deal in situ uh, with, the, with the remaining community and, and place. <coughs> this commission and what followed under, uh, under President Reagan shifted attention away from place and community, stressing that federal policy should have its basic goal, the efficient spatial allocation of resources in the marketplace. My apologies to our humanity colleagues for a little bit of the social science jargon. We'll try and keep it to a minimum. Yes? Good. And as was well reported at the time, the Reagan administration, through domestic and tax policies, effectively said to cities, and this is a quote from Professor President Reagan, you are on your own. Now, despite the recovery in the U.S. economy in the later stages of the, pre of the Reagan presidency, and indeed through the 1990s, the, un the unwinding of, of urban policy, limited as it was, the cuts in federal transfer payments to cities, and the encouragement of the privatization of services served to weaken the fiscal, administrative, and political position of many of these cities I've mentioned. When we studied this in detail a, a while back, we stated that while the Carter administration had pursued privatism as a strategy of urban regeneration, we argued that the Reagan administration and others through the 1980s pursued privatism as a strategy of urban disinvestment, with the voluntary or philanthropic sectors, and I'm quoting here, expected to fill the gap. This didn't happen right away, but looking across the, the landscape of the post-industrial city, or just outside this window, the chickens have indeed come home to roost. Because again, as we heard on Wednesday at 6 o'clock, the mayor quite bluntly said, this city is broke, and the only put people putting money in for capital improvements are indeed the foundations. So what was stated 80, 30 years ago is now with us, front and center. I keep looking for a watch, by the way, here it is. So what has occurred in national urban economic policy over the past 20 years, that's between uh, the time I was just describing and today, has served to support, even accelerate, spatial selectivity. The command and control centers, as we call them, and I mean that largely on the coast, that's how we, we talk about it, the command and control centers have prospered, as have their suburbs. The second tier cities, largely in the south, Atlanta and Houston, Miami, and some in the west coast, Seattle and others, have shared in some of the success. But the resource dependent, and especially the manufacturing cities, have found little support from public policies that are designed to foster 
and support privatism and found they have gone with place and community becoming a distant second for policy attention. Now, coming more up to date, a colleague of ours, Alan Malak, has recently, has recently commented, if the picture of federal urban policy up until the turn of the millennium is mixed, that period from the, from the 40s through to 1990, the picture since year 2000 has been, at least until maybe just very recently, bleak. The administration of, of, of the presidencies of, of President Bush, George W. Bush, showed little or no interest in urban policy or in the plight of the distressed city. In the field of housing, it had no policy other than single-minded desire to, or than a single-minded desire to increase home ownership and showed little sensitivity to the complexities of the urban project or the consequences of their other policies. So what passes for national urban policy today is at best fragmented. The closest approximation to a federal response to the condition and the future of the post-industrial city was the White House Council on Automotive Communities and Workers, charged by the administ uh, Obama administration to address the local impact of the automobile company rescue. But even the federal initiatives that were targeting urban areas and low-income communities through the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, ARRA, was little more than a grossly underfunded rag, uh, grab bag of shovel-ready projects. Most of them, actually, were in transportation initiatives which were often in suburban locations rather than in the distressed central city itself. And, and I have to say that academics are front and centre in this, in this uh, current uh, cul-de-sac that we're in. If there is any identifiable spatial focus for contemporary federal policy, one supported by the think tanks, it is one that doesn't even pay attention to the central city, but focuses its attention on the metropolitan space, the area surrounding the cities. Nothing wrong with that, but it has, again, not also had a similar distressed city focus. And of course, a metropolitan agenda is largely defined by private labour markets and plays into the strength of building the regional economy, too often paying lip service to the acute conditions found in the increasingly dislocated urban core. So with this um, somewhat sober assessment, what are the policy options facing the post-industrial city? Five broad interconnected options I think are in common currency. Some are being actively pursued. I can take you to some places where they're doing things. Others um, are being assessed but show very little progress beyond the growing pile of consultants <coughs> and reports. Now I don't have time, I wouldn't take up your time to go into each of these in detail, but let me just summarize them and maybe we can use this as a framework for discussion later on. Privatism is far from dead. So the first option is to continue what we've been doing. Um, it is perhaps becoming more selective and targeted. So here in Detroit, for example, we are saying basically 139 square miles is basically unmanageable, so we'll squeeze it down to you know, eight square miles. And we'll start it down in Hart Plaza and we'll build a freeway, a, a light rail system up Woodward and that will be the spatial focus of what we are doing uh, in, in the city of, 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 of Detroit. Now maybe I exaggerate to make my point, but I do think that we're pursuing it using private, public and, fu and foundation funds to continue uh, and, and if, 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 if possible put gas into the engine of urban change. A second strategy and one that has been pursued in different ways is to indeed connect the distressed central city with the opportunities in the metropolitan space by connecting the labour market through the house and connecting the housing market through moving to opportunity and through a redesigned transportation system. So there is a regional agenda and the question is how do you connect? What is linkage between the distressed central city? And let us not forget there are 715,000 people living in this city, never mind the other distressed cities we're talking about. Thirdly, um, connecting these two, there's a, a movement uh, abroad to engage in strategic planning uh, to explore uh, as yet defined ways of, quote, shrinking the city. We're not there yet, but we're certainly trying it here in Detroit. We have our own Detroit Works project, currently stalled, but, you know, we're hoping that it will get a little bit of a boost and we'll come back to discussing what we can do about our particular distressed urban core. Fourth, 
In addition to these three, we've all, we're also exploring ways to reutilize the land and property and the neighborhoods that have been emptied out and effectively abandoned uh, through the processes of deindustrialization, and if I might be so bold as, as to suggest, also the neglect of these places through the pursuit of privatism. So if we continue to pursue privatism as a model to fill these places back in, then I would suggest we're, we're, we're choosing the wrong horse. Although there'll be elements of that that are important. And last, and fifthly, and this is my attempt to build my bridge to my, my, my young colleague, Matt Lewis, is that I think there's a movement now to imagine ways to reinvest and transform distressed cities and their neighborhoods by adopting what is emerging perhaps as a new federal, a new paradigm of local, grounded, civic, community and business engagement that is from a, a, a different perspective. Instead of looking for the big corporations to solve the problems, like the Renaissance Center or Pole Town, we look for a different, um, a, a different audience, an audience that is you, an audience that is individualistic, an audience that is young, um, risk-taking, um, wanting to be part of this, of this new landscape. Maybe I'm being naive and, and Pollyannish. But models are emerging that are based on capturing micro and small business development using variations of for-profit and not-for-profit enterprises harnessing the new localism powered by the internet. I mean, you can go online and you can donate five dollars to a new business that might develop making wine in, the, uh, in, in, in Woodbridge. That's a model that we didn't have in the past and I think there are ways to move forward. So with that context, a couple of years ago, I got interested in this topic because of you know, reading and learning about Motown. Where I come from, which is three and a half thousand miles away, Northern Soul, which is what we call it. Northern Soul was the most important music bar none. For us, it was more important than the Merseyside and the Beatles and all the rest. Listening to um, Stevie Wonder and Diana Ross and eventually others like Marvin Gaye was hugely important in the community I came from. So I came here to Detroit, thought this is fantastic, the home of Motown, and then, whew, where's the love gone? <laughs> <laughs> so with that, a few years ago, we began, I began to look at, at the new music industry, and I have to say that it was sparked out of a serendipitous activity that is worth mentioning and then I'm going to hand it over. A young student from the TEU, which is a technical university in Berlin, called us up one day and said, I'm coming to Detroit for my summer. That's the story of Detroit. I'm coming to Detroit for my summer. You know, he could have gone to New Yorker. Anyway. Um, he came to Detroit and he said, could I have a desk? I said, yes. Would I guide him into some work? I said, perhaps. And I then said, but I have a student who speaks a little bit of German, why don't we talk about this new music? And so the pair of them got a little bit involved, and the result is what Matt's about to present to you. Thank you very much. Things brought up in um, Dr. Boyle's introductory remarks about uh, privatism and uh, the role of the private sector in uh, forming these sorts of policies. So yes, uh, post-industrial cities are searching for new economies, uh, and there's a, a, a lot of attention now for public policy frameworks centered around arts and economic development. Uh, so we're going to look at the dimensions of this new cluster and uh, potential for rebranding the Motor City in maybe a uh, brand that once held with uh, uh, the music industry. So you've all heard it before. But I'll say it again. Uh, the industrial economy of Detroit that emerged in the 20th century operated under a Fordist model. Uh, assembly line practices and centralized forms of labor process and work organization. Um, and essentially, we saw a massive migration in the 20th century uh, to Detroit from uh, many parts of the rural south as well as Europe. But uh, uh, emerging from that migration, was a vibrant black economy, uh, one which had significant uh, entertainment economy centered around Black Bottom and Hastings Street. Um, you know, uh, various types of music uh, emerged uh, there, uh, jazz, gospel, even some country music that was present in Detroit in the 20th century. And uh, these would later uh, amalgamate to form uh, what we'd call urban soul music. Uh, 
uh, but at any rate, um, this led to, in uh, the 1960s, what I uh, would call the heyday of the independent record label in Detroit. And, uh, you know, that would change as, as uh, the economy changed as well. So these uh, practices of vertical integration uh, in the industrial economy were integrated uh, or were mirrored in Detroit's music industry in the 1960s, uh, most notably under the banner of Motown Records. Uh, Barry Gordy famously employed these practices in the writing, recording, production, uh, and distribution of records uh, under Motown and subsidiaries. Uh, there was a, virtually a vertical integration of the supply chain in Motown Records, uh, and under this group here, it's a, you know, Bill USA, essentially, songs were written, recorded, produced, published, and distributed, all from under one roof, so. Um, and just a few Motown figures you are certainly acquainted with. Uh, but there was certainly much more happening in, uh, in the Motor City besides Motown. Uh, a, no a number of uh, independent record labels emerged in this era. era. Some of them uh, only put out a few records at a time, but uh, uh, recording facilities, uh, publishing houses uh, were distributed throughout the city in addition to record labels. So this is one map from the uh, Soulful Detroit website, but uh, a more recent map you may have seen uh, uh, compiled by uh, Ben Blackwell, a Detroit musician uh, played at the Dirt Bombs. It's also a, a, a very epic record collector of Detroit, of Detroit soul music. Put together this map uh, based on the, the, the label imprints uh, of various Soul 45s he collected, uh, which generally had the address of the recording studio uh, where they were made. So some of these, like I said, some of these labels only put out a, a handful of records and maybe disappeared forever. But uh, as you can see in this map, these, these, these dots represent uh, various uh, music businesses, uh, generally from the 50s through the 70s, so there's some from the 80s uh, represented here. However, uh, as Robert said, where did the love go? Uh, the <laughs> uh, we've seen many of these uh, small-time enterprises disappear uh, in many ways, sort of mirror mirroring the departure of industry from Detroit. Uh, here you have Fortune Records, very noteworthy uh, in the Northern Soul uh, world, but uh, United Sound Systems, just north of here on the 3rd, is now a vacant structure. Uh, the likes of John Lee Hooker and Parliament Punk Bell recorded this building, and it's currently slated for demolition. And down below, I believe this is the Grain Ballroom, one of Detroit's famed venues. So when you come to Detroit uh, with an interest in Detroit musical history, where do you go? Uh, do you go stand outside of this building? You might, I would, but uh, <laughs> not a lot of people would be interested in that sort of musical tour. So, Motown left in 1972, moving to LA. Uh, I think uh, one of these uh, wonderful record of what's going on is the last recording in the uh, Hispo Studios. And they were seeking uh, movie and television audiences, um, something that they were not afforded in Detroit. And there's much resentment, I guess, for the fact that Motown sort of abandoned Detroit. Uh, their building on Woodward Avenue was left full of records and eventually was demolished. And all that remains is the modest, uh, still very cool, but modest uh, Hill Studio on West Grand. However, uh, Detroit's musical legacy does not end with <coughs> sound. Uh, you are all acquainted with Eight Mile of Film and Eminem. Uh, rap has become uh, one of our signature genres, uh, contemporary genres. However, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about Detroit techno. Um, these gentlemen are known as the Belleville Three, originally from Belleville, Michigan, a western suburb of Detroit. Uh, we have Kevin Saunderson, Juan Adkins, and Derek May. But uh, techno filled the void in the 1980s, uh, left by uh, the departing soul and funk music uh, cluster. Uh, and techno in and of itself was a product of the post-industrial landscape, one might say. Uh, so just to give a little definition of techno for those of you who are unacquainted, uh, it is difficult to define, but it is an electronic music form 
produced by sampling songs and creating beats using drum machines. Uh, some of you may have a more nuanced definition, but uh, we'll just leave it at that for the sake of time. Um, so yes, uh, the industrial pull factors that drove the Great Migration of the 20th century resulted in confluence of musical influences in Detroit, uh, rhythm and blues and jazz, country, gospel mentioned earlier. All met in northern cities like Detroit, uh, by the 1960s, urban soul and working class rock and roll would emerge from these influences to become two of Detroit's hallmark sounds. Uh, techno and electronic dance music, however, would emerge in the 1980s as yet another amalgamation of local music stylings. Uh, this style was initially popularized by Belleville 3, uh, pictured previously, and uh, one of them, I believe it was uh, Lonnie Atkins, uh, was responsible for putting together this compilation called uh, uh, Techno, the New Dance Sound of Detroit, was released on CD in 1988 by Virgin Records and distributed throughout Europe, uh, widely popularizing the genre uh, overseas, more, more, uh, where it received more acclaim than it ever did uh, domestically. And by 2000 uh, arose the Detroit Electronic Music Festival, uh, which is now known as M Movement. But, uh, this festival attracts uh, tens of thousands of people annually in, I think it's March or May, I can't remember. Um, uh, many of whom are international uh, and are coming to the birthplace of techno music to experience it. So, uh, the connection to Europe uh, with techno is, is interesting because there, uh, this felt connection uh, like this gentleman from Berlin who came here uh, feeling an affinity for Detroit somehow. Uh, I guess European audience, <coughs> audiences embraced uh, techno music uh, more so than, than I guess we ever have here. But uh, as uh, the techno music uh, scene in Detroit grew, there's an evolving network of artists, studios, agents, and venues. Uh, and essentially, uh, People uh, framing policy uh, saw techno as a potential opportunity for which to capitalize on. So, um, this here is a map uh, in the style of Piet Mondrian uh, of some famous Detroit techno scenes downtown. So, uh, well, now we'll get into a little discussion about the cultural economy. Um, so transitioning to a post-Fordist economy, according to cultural theorist Stuart Hall, will involve a shift to new information technologies, more flexible, decentralized forms of labor process and work organization, as well as an economy based on flexible accumulation. That's a little different than Barry Gordy's Motown model. Um, Alan Scott uh, refers to service and entertainment sector as a component of the cultural economy. Such an economy is place-based. The unique history of a place and the ideas and styles derived from it are important aspects of a local cultural economy. So Scott lists the following as main elements involved in the success of a cultural economy. They have direct <coughs> human involvement, independent small business enterprises, close ties with the local labor market, uh, local linkages between those small enterprises, and an emerging institutional framework. Uh, now, some people have criticized uh, uh, pursuing uh, cultural economic policies uh, because better research is required to understand the relationship between specific policies. Uh, for example, designated cultural visitors and tourists targeted cultural investments uh, with economic development. Others in the literature have warned of pursuing local music policies as if music were a self-contained local sector. And uh, to put that in give you an example of that. Uh, when John Lee Hooker came to Detroit in the 1940s, he didn't come to pursue a music career. He came to work uh, for Henry Ford. So. Now we're going to get into the public policies and uh, tying into what uh, Dr. Boyle's opening remarks uh, involving uh, the transition from, uh, or the, the combination of state and private, uh, or state and public and private uh, initiatives. So the state of Michigan, uh, uh, as you many of you are familiar, uh, uh, launched a program earlier in the decade, or last decade, called the Cool Cities Initiative. 
they discuss potential policies of cultural economic development under the Grand Home Administration. Uh, during the fervor surrounding the ideas of Richard Flores book, The Rise of the Creative Class. Uh, one of the only policies to actually emerge from this discussion was uh, Governor Granholm's Cool Cities program. Uh, this program sought to promote economic development within selected cities with a focus on new consumption services and through improving quality of life using a combination of tax incentives, grants, and other, and other assistance programs, and thus build both vibrant energetic cities that attract jobs, people, and opportunity. And the six guiding principles of cool cities were to support innovation, grow and retain talent, embrace diversity, invest in and build on the quality of places, think regionally, as was mentioned earlier, uh, and use places to make connections. And remember our earlier point about uh, Stuart, from Stuart Hall about local communities. Uh, cool cities, however, uh, has received much criticism, and some might argue that it cut in pie into many thin slices, making sure that everybody got a little taste, uh, but the only problem was that everybody was still a little bit hungry afterwards. Uh, cities like Grand Rapids and Detroit, uh, the two biggest in Michigan, received Cool Cities funding for various projects, but so did every other city in Michigan, it seemed. Uh, uh, I think Adrian, Michigan. Not my, no offense to people from Adrian, but not exactly a cool city in my book. Um, okay, and then there was a sub-regional <coughs> metropolitan strategy uh, that emerged in 2008, uh, undertaken by uh, the previously mentioned Detroit Renaissance Group, a uh, group of uh, business leaders uh, from the metro area. Uh, and in their Roads to Recovery uh, uh, study, they underwent a uh, a subsection study that uh, argued that downtown Detroit should become the focus of a formalized creative industries cluster, the first listed element of which would be music and music production. Uh, however, when the research measured, measured Detroit against a set of leading music clusters, uh, well-known names like Atlanta, Austin, Nashville, and Seattle, uh, the results were not all that encouraging. Uh, Detroit had 40% fewer music workers uh, than comparison cities and was not adding them at a noteworthy rate in the early 2000s. Uh, but uh, the study itself acknowledges the weakness of these measures because it's very hard to uh, measure who exactly is a music worker. Uh, and if you have a friend in a band or in a band yourself, you might not be receiving an actual paycheck, so it's hard to document yourself. So. Um, uh, they noted that Detroit has a strong range of venues, but they are widely dispersed across the region. Uh, and if I may quote the report, there currently exists no epicenter of live music in Detroit. This can prove particularly important in supporting potential music festivals. South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, for example, succeeds in part because the conference and the hosting venues are largely located within immediate proximity to one another. It will remain difficult for Detroit to establish a single musical focal point given the location of existing music businesses. On the right side, uh, Detroit Renaissance acknowledged the importance of Detroit's showcase events like movement, uh, and the fact that Detroit has an unquantifiable cool factor. Uh, additionally, the local music industry contributes $285 million in economic activity, though this represents a easily 0.1% of the $2 billion metro GDP. Um, We've uh, not really seen much from the city uh, in terms of a, a music policy. Uh, they did intervene uh, in the movement festival and uh, got a <coughs> successful company based in Ferndale called Paxahow to uh, be the new events promoter for movement and then virtually brought it back from the bank brain. Um, it's now quite a profitable venture. But uh, we haven't heard much talk about uh, cultural planning in the Detroit Works Project discussion. Day. And we'll get to the foundations in a bit. Okay, I'll hear these songs. Okay, so this is, uh, we'll skip ahead here. This is stuff I just talked about. Um, now, we uh, conducted our own analysis for any of the but we tried to compile a list of uh, music production supply chain uh, entities uh, in the metro area. And 
for those that we could find address, because uh, this is basically what we were able to plot out. Uh, there is a small music cluster in Detroit, I would not deny it, but um, uh, the, tr the changes in the music industry and uh, the way business operates today make it difficult to kind of pinpoint their locations. Uh, some places just operate off of a PO box and a website. Um, it's not like uh, the map we saw of the uh, done by Glenn Fenn Blackwell, where everybody had uh, bricks and mortar locations. And this is obviously lacking. We, we know of many more. We have a database of many more uh, entities, but uh, really we're not able to assign them to geographic location. So another uh, metro-wide uh, policy initiative, uh, a branding initiative, was conducted by the Detroit Metropolitan Convention and Visitors Bureau. Uh, in which they uh, listed the unique attributes of Detroit to be cars, culture, gaming, sports, and youth. Um, uh, we'll get to this. But anyway, the, uh, the D initiative, which was the branding campaign by the Visitors Bureau, uh, sought uh, to use Detroit's musical heritage as a centerpiece in attracting 21 to 24 year, or 34 year old demographic as a visitor target audience. Uh, the Visitors Bureau website mentions Detroit techno heritage as a unique feature in Detroit's visitor appeal. Uh, they put together a two day itinerary on their website with local music sites, but there's little uh, information about how to access these sites in any sort of formal way. And if you can imagine yourself coming to Detroit as a tourist, uh, expecting to take public transportation and being able to easily find these sites, you can imagine the difficulty uh, in uh, actually giving this itinerary. Um, in, okay. Oops. In 2008, uh, we saw another initiative uh, get underway called the Creative Cluster Regional Assessment. Uh, Gensler, a national firm of architects and planners, picked up the reins of Detroit Renaissance's pre uh, uh, study and, uh, and were commissioned by foundation communities and uh, the new incarnation of Renaissance Business Leaders for Michigan uh, for a Creative Corridor study for Midtown Detroit. Uh, the story is very familiar to you all, I'm sure. Um, but again, music was mentioned as a key component of a creative con economy strategy. In 2010, uh, the Detroit Creative Corridor Center was launched, uh, and this was a this is a creative business incubator of sorts on the new campus expansion of Detroit's College for Creative Studies in the Argonaut Building in the new center. Um, early activities, however, had not appeared to promote music production or performance. So now we'll get to the foundations. Uh, Christie Foundation uh, launched an arts fellowship in 2010 for performing arts. Uh, they had done a 2009 fellowship for literary arts, and they've set out to do to alternate those two fellowships every year. Uh, but nine $25,000 pretty handsome fellowships were awarded in 2010 to performing artists, seven of whom turned out to be musicians. Um, and I recommend you guys check out this guy. Tim Lampanen, known as Timmy Volger, and see who they've awarded his uh, awards to. Um, but at any rate, um, in 2012, they plan on expanding the number of performing arts recipients to 12. So uh, this initiative seems to gain some momentum. Uh, Crispy fellows, fellows are eligible for significant pre professional development assistance. Uh, and if I may quote from their website, fellows may participate in a range of artistic and professional development activities created to specifically respond to and support their needs and expectations. Professional development activities will focus on providing artists at any stage of their career with the skills, resources, knowledge, and connections they need to continue to establish and fulfill their artistic and professional ambitions. Uh, other local foundations have supported music education programs and made grants to music institutions, though not much has been done in the realm of popular music. Skillman has done some Arts or some music education grants, and you've seen donations to things like the same. Um, so, to conclude, 
couple of quotes here. All that is solid melts in the air is our is our music industry uh, evaporating in, in the way that uh, our heavy industry has? Uh, well, maybe not. But uh, we certainly did not build the city on rock and roll. <laughs> uh, rock and roll was perhaps a byproduct of other economic, or music was a byproduct of other economic forces. Can we really uh, keep it cool by creating a policy framework and, and preserve Detroit's uh, unquantifiable cool uh, char characteristics? Um, we do have a new music industry, but it is not very concentrated and uh, really hard to pinpoint. Uh, you know, our survey metrics are possibly not the, we were possibly we're not going about this the most scientific and best way, but. As we said earlier, it was very difficult to find this information. Is there truly a visitor attraction? Um, it's yet to be thought of. And Detroit Techno certainly has enhanced our international uh, cachet, but what can we do to bolster this? And uh, our, I think our suburban population is also drawn to the music industry. So we need to figure out how to capitalize on that. <coughs> and can the new music, this is the big one for the end, sorry. Can the new music industry overcome the racial divide? But <laughs> that's all. Thank you. <laughs>
can we trust foundations is a big question. They're driving a lot of policy uh, uh, going on right now. The Troy Works Project, M1 Rail, uh, and I frankly don't have an answer to that. George, huh. do you folks think that the music industry future in Detroit is essentially going to be one where you're trying to attract more tourism to the city and that's its economic benefit? Or is it really trying to export, produce, and make money by selling music to the larger world, regardless of whether anyone here comes to see the iconic sites of the music? Uh, well, the nature of the music business, I don't see us being a producer of music in the sense of a national. It's, it's hard, yeah, it's hard to compete uh, with these powers that be. If you look at other places like Nashville, where you have like the concentrated activity of music production supply chain, frankly, I don't see that happening in Detroit. Uh, though I do anticipate us exporting artists, though not their final product. Uh, so, from maybe a live music perspective, Detroit does have a future uh, in a sort of like tourist music industry, but in terms of sightseeing, no. If I can announce that, and, and I think I, I need to support uh, what uh, Matt has said, and that I got him into this, is I, I saw this uh, duality here. Um, on the one hand, um, I, was, I have been and, and I'm critical of the visitor strategy branding Detroit around something like music, which I think is, is, is very difficult to do when we've got such a, 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 an ephemeral and dispersed and uncoordinated small industry. It's very difficult to do it. And I thought, therefore, well, what I was looking at was um, the message um, greatly exaggerating the reality. And I thought that was, a, and I think that is uh, an economic, um, an economic development weakness. It's a challenge. It's a problem. On the other hand, um, my interest in this area, with, with the help of Matt and, uh, and others, was was really to, to perhaps um, ask a question that as we move into this fifth option that I described in my opening remarks, this notion of a, of a much more um, fragmented, atomistic, granular approach to economic development, perhaps um, the opportunity that the, the new technology and the internet provides will create opportunities for people to um, grow their, quote, business, unquote. Um, we can't see it. We, we, it's very hard to touch. But um, if you if you read popular literature, this does seem to be an area that um, people are working in. Mean, if, if you take the uh, media industry, the um, the, the, uh, the news industry, and you and you try and understand the way in which the media issues issues group operates, that's the people that produce the Model D website and the like, uh, which many of you I'm sure look at and use. I mean, is it the actual business structure of that organization is very difficult to understand. Most of them are freelancers. Most of them earn pennies for the, per work. Um, and, and therefore, they live this new world of, of working for a whole lot of different clients. Perhaps there's an analogy there with what might be occurring in the sampling music world, uh, you know, where you sit uh, in your basement with a, with a, uh, a refurbished Apple laptop and, and use the garage band to produce your sounds, which you then distribute on the internet. And how you get any money back, I don't know. But um, it is it is today. It is not Barry Gordy's Ford's model of, of, of a supply chain in the music industry. Sorry for the long answer, I apologize. At the back, sir, and then coming forward, please, with the hat. I, uh, um, I was looking at the maps, and uh, uh, the old maps show that I'd say probably most of uh, most of the uh, the music industry in Detroit was outside of Grand Boulevard, and uh, newer maps, the stuff you were able to find, a lot of that stuff was out in the neighborhoods as well. And uh, obviously, you can't find everything. Cause pretty much everybody's on MySpace or a website, um, and it's very difficult to quantify where exactly people are. But um, what is the possibility for policy initiatives that actually encourage brick and mortar development through? Uh, uh, incubators or hacker or music maker space, that sort of thing. And did you find anything like that in your research 
uh, where other cities used any sort of policy initiatives that encouraged that sort of thing. And I mean, pertaining to retention. Did you say hackerspace? Yeah, that's wonderful. I love that. I love that. Can we write that one down? Hackerspace. We're going to be the first to, to do an incubator for the hacker industry. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar, there, there is a there's almost an industry in, um, in, 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 the, in the US that combines the opportunity for flexible artistic space with a real estate model. And it's been widely developed in other parts of the country. We don't have one in Detroit, although there is a discussion to try and find ways that we could um, use a lot of the property that is sitting either half empty or empty, uh, although young Matt Lewis here just bought one of these, um, to, to create space for, um, for, for this business. Um, for those of you who, who may be following the details, uh, Capitol Park has a number of buildings which are currently lying very empty uh, down in, in downtown, where the bus station used to be before it moved across to uh, Rosa Parks. And there's an RFP that's been issued by the Economic Growth Corporation, the organization I slammed an hour ago, so apologies for that. Um, they are suggesting looking for ideas. And some of the ideas that are in the mill for that might include um, a space that is uh, available for uh, these uh, fledgling industries. So I think my answer is people have been talking about it. I haven't seen any yet. We do have a, 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 a artistic building uh, in the in the um, what's the name of the street? Zach, Zachary's um, um, developed uh, off Woodward. Sugar Hill. Thank you. Whoever said that? Sugar Hill um, has got this idea, but it's, it, it's very formal, uh, expensive, um, difficult, and, and, and I don't think that's the sort of space that the, the hacker would, uh, would be afford, able to afford to go into. So I think it's scale, affordability, um, synergy with other organizations that might find space. I mean, if you had, a, like the Russell Industrial Center shrunk down to small spaces like, like cupboards, so instead of getting, you know, 4,000 square feet, you get uh, 400 square feet. Then, you know, it's easy in, easy out. That could be an interesting space with a really good internet service and, and a power plant. And, and a, 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 a power plant. That's all you need, really. Yeah, Russell's a good example of uh, that happening outside of the policy world. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know the Detroit Economic Growth Corporation has sponsored something downtown uh, called it's Park Studios, giving money to uh, the guys who run that studio to have like, an internet uh, radio live broadcast thing where you can actually see them from the street. And it's like an open studio for music uh, performers to come and play. So there's some some sort of like grant making for that that sort of thing that's on a pretty small scale. Uh, we have a question here and then several others. Yes, ma'am. Have you found in your research um, connected works between the music industry and the emerging movie industry? We all observe that there have been um, some filming going on uh, in the area. So I'm just curious whether there is some kind of a support network um, going on. And part two of my question is, what about um, local colleges? Uh, are there programs that we have for building talents in the area? Because you mentioned that we don't have that, um, you know, the, the, the talent or um, some some kind of support to to develop um, emerging talents in the music industry. Well, I can uh, talk about the movie industry first. Um, I did notice some connections with the the uh, movie surgeon in the movie industry in, in uh, Michigan and. The, the existing music industry. In fact, uh, a couple of, a couple of the studios with better web presences uh, had their had information for like sound uh, services uh, and resumes of movies they worked on that had been filming in town. So I, there's definitely some crossover there. Uh, uh, in terms of building talent, uh, we have some performing arts high schools here, and there's been some grant making, but grant making by like the Skillman Foundation for Music Education. Um, one of Detroit Renaissance Studies critiques was that uh, local universities, they didn't even talk about community colleges, but they talked about uh, Wayne State and 
University of Michigan uh, not graduating uh, comparable amounts of music performance and engineering uh, students as the other music cluster cities. So that seemed to be something that was lacking. So I just, uh, in terms of popular music though, it's kind of questionable how many popular musicians come out of the formalized music training. So it's hard to say. Maybe in terms of the production side, uh, that would be more valuable. Just a couple of comments. If you read um, some of the history of Wutan, um, particularly the, the more serious scholarly work, a lot of it makes reference to the extent to which a lot of the young singers got their initial training through this public school system. That the, the public school system gave them the opportunity, which they then developed through the choir of church. Uh, but with the loss of both of these institutions, um, you, you therefore have to do more because people don't have that intrinsic uh, training in voice or in reading uh, music. But the other story that um, we sort of touched on in, in, in Matt's presentation was the loss of, of, of Mota um, in comparison to. Um, um, Nashville, Memphis, and, and some of the other cities around the world, the loss of Motown that meant that we didn't get the, uh, the, 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 the intrinsic legacy of the wealth of this industry remaining in the town. For example, uh, if you go to Liverpool, England, um, the, uh, McCarthy has endowed not just a program, not just a degree, he has endowed a university that now um, serves the music industry. Uh, in, uh, in, in Liverpool, one of the most deprived cities in, in, the, United, uh, in the United Kingdom. And if you go and look at, Me uh, at, at Memphis, um, they have got many foundations that provide training uh, in, the music, in the music performance, but also in the music industry. When I looked for what um, had come out of that music the wealth, there was very little to find. I mean, Seeger has a, a foundation, but any, has anybody in this room ever heard of it? I didn't think so, and yet he does. It's not publicized, it's, it's, fully, it's not fully funded, and he doesn't actually put money into the music industry, he puts it into other things. Um, so then that's the one thing I could find. Uh, perhaps a Madonna or Eminem will, will put some of their money in, into the city, I, I, I don't know. Per, uh, Kid Rock maybe is the most, you know, obvious example, at least he's given us beer. Well, and he's funded a music scholarship. Yes. Uh, if we could just have one last question from the back, maybe. Yeah. Uh, I think you guys uh, may be working up the wrong tree. I don't think they're for anybody's feelings. But uh, did you all, there was just an article in the Los Angeles Times uh, day before yesterday about people moving to Detroit because of uh, the advantages, and we're talking musicians and artists, okay? But I would also argue that we have a very, very or very fine musicians. Somebody said something about lack of talent. Uh, sorry. Uh, I have said that. Okay. Right. <laughs> sorry, you're wrong. Okay. Um, now, the thinking about Detroit music, we're talking about the post-industrial city here, right? Post-industrial means that there's going to be different ways of doing things. The old music industry that we think of as Motown and all that, that's gone, and it's never coming back. And thank goodness, okay? Uh, people are now independently structuring their marketing, their business. Uh, musicians are making it happen. Uh, you don't no longer need a big studio to record. With the digital age, you have people with in basements and garages and, uh, and in their front rooms doing very high quality recording, but it's, dispersed nationally and internationally digitally, okay? Forget about CDs, forget about those black vinyl things with holes in the middle, that's not what's gonna make you uh, money anymore. You're also not gonna have the industry the way people wanna think about the auto industry. Well, one more question. I don't think that's all that different than what we were saying, though, we agree. because uh, we agree. Uh, how do you institutionally support the music industry? That's what you're questioning. So if it's going to be an organic industry, how can institutional support be provided other than maybe like the Tresky Fellowships? 
Um, but to the point about Motown, Motown was not necessarily a sophisticated operation. It was a basement recording studio in a house on West Grand Boulevard. It, you know, it grew into something larger. Uh, so can we grow something again like that is sort of the question we're looking at. I think there's just one more comment that wants to be made, please. But yeah, if you're talking about developing an industry or talking about developing a connection, not five blocks down the street is one of the premier school of the arts in Detroit as a role as around the country. What the principal of that school did 10, 12 years ago, where she started to build what is built now and have it connected to Maxim Fisher Orchestra Hall and be in the Wayne State area and not be a feeder into the Wayne State's arts program is what concerns me. Many of the students that come out of that, not to mention the school that we have just up the street, Detroit Windsor Dance Academy, internationally renowned, what I don't see happening is I don't see connections of what we have right here with us. No, we may not get another Motown per se, however, we do have feeder institutions within walking distance that I think a relationship could be developed because the talent that is in that school right now, you can't get in that school without an audition and students from the suburbs come to the school that's in the heart of Midtown. And I'm not sure, I haven't heard anything with respect to any kind of relationship, any kind of opportunity, or even just the mention of that school in this particular report, which is what bothered me. I didn't hear anyone say, we went to DSA, and wow, what we found there could literally start another building trend or a connection. Um, I hope you'll stick around for the afternoon when at least Robin Boyle will be back up here in part of a panel discussion. And I hope all of you will take a chance to come up to both speakers later in the day. But we're going to have to move on. So I apologize for not giving you a chance to respond. But I'd like to go ahead and introduce the next speaker.